Dark decided that we're going to have to take it to that's where we get to total war. And do we get we got to this? Did we mobilize the entire economy? And it's every p every industry, everything it's got to be for the war effort. And that means the entire population. And to Ludendorff's concept, and every country would adopt this in some way, must be geared up to win the war. So all together to win the war, with the idea being we need everybody. But also that means that if everybody's important for the war effort, isn't everybody a target now? And if that's true, we take the war to the enemy, meaning their home. And a new front is going to be created that we go backwards in time, the home front. And what that means, it's not just what happens at home while soldiers go off to fight. It is the fact that the home is now a target, just like the Western Front or Eastern Front or Balkan Front or whatever front. Everybody will be a target. If you can weaken them at home, you can win the war. And this comes from the concept that we can't win that big battle. What is it called where you try to kill so many of the enemy, they try to they quit? But the problem is, especially with the Germans, we don't have enough men for this. So we've got to take that attrition to their home and make people <coughs> suffer. This should remind you of Sherman's march to the sea. Make them suffer. And so that is when this concept of little kids being targeted in war. That's 1939. And the thought was the Germans would use gas if they attacked London or other cities in England. As it turned out, gas was such an ineffective weapon, they didn't use it in World War II that much, for the most part. But once you have the logical idea that you can use gas, you can use all kinds of weapons. And so there are three reasons for total war. Strategic means long term. So tactical short term on the battlefield. Tactical is the idea, you know, the enemy's attacking here, I'll go around his right and hit him with a flank attack. That's tactical. Strategic long term plans. And that is why weapons that are involved in these kind of actions for total war are called strategic weapons. For example, all those intercontinental ballistic missiles, 100 of them around Great Falls, those are called strategic weapons. Because they're not to win a battle, but they're to, to win the war. Knock out their, well, you kill their people, they can't fight the war. Of course, then again, you destroy the world, you can't fight the war either. But all we care about is victory. But that's only funny in a very dark and too close to the truth way. But, number one, destroy industry. If they can't produce, for example, these are shells in a British shell factory, if you slow down that production of shells, they can't fight at the front. So you take the war to knock out their industry. That is why total war isn't really a concept before the Industrial Revolution, because it really, industry didn't really matter that much. You know, yes, you have to manufacture things at home, you have people at home making, like shell, uh, making the paper cartridges for muskets, but not the same as factory <coughs> I should add that's 1916, and those are British heavy shells, and they try to make them so fast that they uh, about, uh, that they made so many mistakes that a third of them were duds. In fact, have you ever heard the term dud? It came out of World War One. Yeah. They kind of look like little penguins. I have never seen that before, but that's. By the way, you catch up. These shells are so heavy, they have to have the hook in the front so they can lift them up. Penguins. Anyone else see penguins there? Well, now that you mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Now you've destroyed this. Penguins are not effective weapons for more. The British did. Have you seen a big one? What? Oh, yeah, that's a valid point. So, with that, transport them. Knock out the transportation. So, this fits in the same vein. Okay, maybe you can't knock out the factories, but if you can't get the raw materials or you can't get the goods from the factory to the front, it's the same net effect. And that's why transportation facilities would be so important in World War I, like a blockade. World War II, let's bomb railroads. Today, what's the first target? Transportation facilities, bridges, roads, etc. Yeah, civilians live near those, but oh, oil. This is the first war where fuel became a major target. 
most European countries don't have a major source of oil. In fact, Britain had, or Britain has none. Greece had none then. Germany had none. Virtually no sources of oil. A little bit in Austria, a little bit in Romania, but no oil. And oil is becoming more and more important to win the war. Oil will be targeted in World War One. In fact, Britain will do all sorts of things, like create a country called Iraq because they wanted oil. That will have no consequences down the road. And World War II, it's all about oil. The whole thing is about oil, it seems like. Germany attacked the Soviet Union, oil. Japan attacked at Pearl Harbor, oil. They wanted a Dutch colony called the Dutch East Indies, and so they thought they could knock the US out so they could take the Dutch East Indies. Indonesia, oil. That's why it's oil. And today, so many military and foreign policy decisions by the United States are based upon oil. As we should all well know in your lifetime. And so it happens here. But I should add, it's really hard to hit a factory. And they can hide factories, put them underground. In fact, the Germans would become masters in World War II of burying factories, disperse them, put them in places you can't find. And in 1917, it's hard to destroy a factory. What's easier? What's an easier way to do? Just bomb everywhere. You're on the right track. Bomb, not quite everywhere. Why? Because what? The people, yeah, the people who work there and stuff. If you kill the workers, don't you shut the factory down? So civilians become a legitimate target to knock the factories out. If you can't hit the factories, you kill the civilians. Remember what I told you: total war is taking the war to the enemy. And think about it now: if you start targeting civilians, that comes to part two: morale. Break their morale. Make the war so miserable. Make the suffering so bad that the people want to quit. Remember that, breaking their will. And so it is a twofold one. This is in Britain, World War II. And because of the German submarine blockade, there were food shortages. So you notice she is looking at the sign where they're talking about rationing meat. And by the way, carcass meat, that's kind of the scrap meat. Because if you're rationing meat, because there's a shortage of meat due to a German blockade, that's what you get. And basically, that's how many uh, ration cards. You have a certain number a month, and so you only get a certain amount of meat a month. Make people suffer. Make the war miserable. Obviously, we're going to get worse than this, but make it miserable. Because it has a twofold effect. If people at home are suffering, soldiers at the front. So these are British soldiers, and they're reading letters or writing letters home. And if they think their family is suffering, their morale, they, the, the feeling of us, their morale will begin to crack in no one hand the war. And there is a big argument that part of the reason why the Russian Revolution happened was because of food riots in St. Petersburg, bread riots in, okay, in, our, in the Gregorian calendar we use now, March of 1917. You see similar things in 1980. <coughs> it doesn't always work this way, but that was a feeling. <coughs> It caused this. Well, let's get to the next step, and it's even more important. We can't win on the battlefield. And it ties together with knocking out factories and knocking out or turning morale. Total war is state sponsored terrorism. We can't win the war by normal means. We can't win the war by no, um, on the battlefield. We can't, nobody's willing to come to a peace conference, so we'll use state sponsored terrorism. Have that threat of potential death, misery destruction on regular people. Make them suffer so much that this is what we gotta get. Tear, so they revolt and drive their government out. They will make their lives so miserable because of the war. The threat of death, destruction, or starvation. These are people in Germany in 1918. The blockade became literally a starvation blockade. To starve the population, there's nothing more terrifying than starvation for humans. Nothing more terrifying. I'd say almost all animals, I would argue. Except for goats, right? Goats, 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 you can't you can't hurt a goat. 
don't trust. Burning alive, burning alive, burning alive, they're blind. Yeah, I was going to say starvation. But, but, there's a difference. Actually, there is a big difference. We can all come up with horrific torture that are terrifying. And trust me, we're humans. We can find all kinds of horrifying tor uh, tortures that will hurt us. But the point about the starvation is it could happen to anybody. And that's what makes it terrifying. Anybody, just random chance. It could hit you and hit your family hard. Just have to be where, happens to be where you live. If you're at the line at the wrong time to get the food. That is why this, and that's actually true. What, why terrorism is so scary is the random nature. And this shows a house in London that was bombed. So the Germans started bombing cities. The problem is they couldn't make anything. And so they would literally just start dropping bombs in 1917 in residential areas. So the bombs would just kind of randomly fall. So what house is hit and what house isn't? Nobody knows. Yeah. And that's what makes it so scary because it could be yours. And you look at that, just regular family, their, their homes destroyed, and people would be, that could be me. And that's what makes it so scary. Yeah, it's a wedge. It's I won't give you that. Okay, so. So a blockade fits in morale, but terror. And so the concept is, if we make them suffer so much. Now, I have to add a caveat. That is the goal. Does that happen? If somebody bombs you, are you more likely to hate your government for not protecting you and want to overthrow it, or hate the people bombing you? And see, it doesn't always work. Total war has goals. It doesn't work. It's really random. In fact, part of the problem with total war, since it's so random, is it might not be worth it. But everybody does it. That might not be. It's really arguable it doesn't work. But everybody does it because they are desperate to end the war. And that's why it's so dangerous. That's why it is one of the most horrible things ever invented by humankind. Because when people are desperate, they do things like this. So with that, how do you convince people to do this? How do you encourage them to take what's going on well, the number one method is propaganda. You can't force everybody to do it because you try to force everybody to do it when they have kind of that revolt you fear. You have to make people want to take the war to the enemy, but also take their attacks on you. If you're targeting them, aren't they targeting your home front? That's when it gets scary. That is the key. So the propaganda. And just to review, propaganda, it's that it's from the government, but it's anybody trying to promote a point of view. And this is going to be used as justification. And it is wrapped in nationalism, that intense pride of your country. If you don't go with your country, you're in a way supporting the enemy. Remember nationalism. It's not love of your country for what it stands for. It's love of your country because it's your country. So to unify everybody. So, the number one thing is, sure, we could say, yes, the U.S. is great, or France, whatever country we're in. But let's be honest. What is the strongest emotion? Fear. And how do you get, how do you get your people to fear the enemy? Hate. Dehumanize them. That breeds fear. If you can breed that fear, that will lead to the hate. And then, once you dehumanize them, I'll get to the sacrifice in just a second. I hit it twice by mistake. Then, that justifies attacking their families, attacking children, killing them, starving them, because you're saying they're not really human. They're evil, and this poster shows it. This is a really good one. You see the little devils? Who do they represent? And who's the head of Germany? Kaiser. Kaiser, Kaiser Bill. Kaiser Wilhelm. And his little, little beers above. So they're little Satans. And what have they just done? 
Murder. Kill Murder. babies and children and women and non combatants. Now, where do they come up with these numbers? Yeah. We'll make up numbers. And they're going to do it to us. So we have no choice but to. You can't. How do you talk to a devil? Oh, look at this one. This inhuman beast. This is America. You're, <laughs> are you for this? Fiend or America? Hey, make up your mind, people. You're either with us or you're in the stocks. Actually, that's pretty close to the way it was. And so the thing is, if you can breed this kind of hate, then that will get your country ready to make that. Okay, make that move to justify killing children. But the other thing is this. What about the sacrifice? We have to make. If we're going to mobilize the entire economy for war, what's going to happen to things like clothes or things you use at home or food? What's going to happen? There'll be shortages, won't there? If the enemy's attacking you, might you too be a victim? Might you too be killed? Might you be a target? We have to be ready to make that sacrifice. And so, hate and propaganda encourages people to think it's worth it. It's worth it or they win. And I can't emphasize that enough. Them. The others. Remember that Christmas truce? You don't want people coming together and realizing we're all the same. You want them to kill. Or to kill them, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not them to kill. You have to kill them. That means killing their children. Don't forget that. That's what war has become. Now the technology is there. After World War I, most of the casualties will be civilian. Most of the people who died in Iraq when the United States invaded in 2003, well over 500,000 were Iraqi civilians. Lots of children. Why? That's who the target is. And so, and by the way, people don't know what they're getting into when they go to war. So look at this kind of hatred. Here's to convince British children. It's the dreadnought. It's the boys war paper. Hey, you got to start indoctrinating the kids when they're young. We might need them as soldiers in a few years. But this is showing German soldiers using Brit wounded British soldiers as human shields. Look how evil they are. Now I ask you, is that realistic? Yeah, I'm going to run away from the British attack of me, so I'm going to grab a wounded British soldier, put him on my shoulders, and stagger away. No, it's ridiculous. Anybody would realize that's ridiculous, but we don't care, do we? All we want is to get that into your skull. They're evil. They're evil. They're evil. What's good propaganda? Keep it simple and repeat it over and over again. Just watch a television, or just watch a commercial. Heck, think about all those little pop-up ads when you're on when you're on the internet. Do you even look at them? Well, they know you don't look at them. They just hit you a little bit. Over and over, they just sticks. And you even realize it. So here's another one. This is nationalism, all kinds of things, encourage them to uh, fear, but women of Britain say, go. What does it imply to young men? You better go volunteer or what? Huh? We'll be killed. Not only that, we're done. They will kill your family. And one more thing, the women of Britain will think you're a coward, and they won't like you anymore. That's fear. Next. <laughs> Here's a good one. First off, see Germany, the brute, blood, the monster. Now, I've been to Germany. I have relatives who are German. They don't look like this. Remember, and everyone knows they don't look like that. It's just to ingrain that. But the idea is if they win, question mark, what will the world be? But who, what country is that a propaganda poster for? Do you catch it? It's a great one. Good guess, but no. Australia. Exactly. 
It's Australia. Well, it's when they put Australia here when it's all about Europe. They have to turn the, the globe around. So you can still see Australia's down here, right? Because if it was for Europe, it was without Europe. The United States without the Atlantic. Speaking of that, here it says America enlists in the U.S. Army. That's obviously German. Destroy this map route. And that's implying, what's this? Yeah, destruction of Europe. Europe. And now he's on the shores of America. But the best part, I think one of the most clever, do you see it? What's that? But that's part of it, and what just happened to him? We can guess what's either going to happen or just happened, right? But the other part is, I, that's a good part about it. See the club? Culture. Culture. And what is German culture? Good propaganda. Here's another one. Those are German submarines that's plying, implying that they murder, hidden in the oceans, and kill. Here's another one. Huns kill women and children. Huns are Germans. And go tell it to the Marines. And why, what's he about ready to do? You guys are going to join. No. <laughs> it's implying you should join. This, this guy did a lot of great posters. I'll show you another one. German, same deal. Are you and you? And here, remember that? I talk, talked about that fake German mythology about the Aryan and that kind of did you catch it in there? We're protecting them. So everybody used it. Both sides, we find Russia, we find Austria. They all did the same propaganda. Hate, sacrifice, nationalism. But this will breed xenophobia. Every single war will breed this. This idea, xenophobia means fear of outsiders, a.k.a. nativism. Every single war does this. And so I put four different examples of conflict. Civil War, during Irish and German, nativism. Immigrants after World War I, the idea that would be somehow communist revolutionaries. What does this refer to in World War II? Japanese. Yeah, Japanese internment. And this is just a couple years ago, during, with the horrific civil war that's still going on in Syria, and when there was talk of allowing some Syrian refugees in the United States. The U.S. had a lot to do with this war. No, the U.S. has basically allowed none, and now we've allowed none to the United States. And so, this breeds it, though. This fear of others leads to this fear of outsiders. Every single war leads to this. Every one. But especially in modern war with the propaganda. Because you can't just simply say, let's hate outsiders. Hate them. Hate them. Hate those who are not with us. And then turn around when the war is over and say, okay, now we're all friends. No, the hate doesn't shut off. Every single time in the 20th century, after wars, there'll be a time of retraction in nativism. But did it seem to work? To some, total wars seemed to work in a couple different places. But most importantly, it seemed that total war brought victory for Germany in the February Revolution. And who revolted? Yes. Why does it say February? I don't know. February. Yeah. I mean, the word is technically like February, but like, I, I kind of like February. I have no idea why I did that. I'm putting it down like that. I'm writing that. The orange right? I think I was adding that and not paying attention. No, I <laughs> Should I change it? No. no. See how many people know this. All right. And That's one of the problems when you. <laughs> but who's what country's out? Yeah, the Russians revolted, and it seemed like the German efforts at total war worked. It seemed like it worked. They revolted over to the Tsar. Now, as it turned out, there were many reasons why. In fact, a whole combination of really bad things and a horrible winter, uh, horrible winter of 1916. That led to a terrible harvest in 1916. So all kinds of bad things happened. But it seemed to work, this revolt. And this just terrified all the countries of the war. All the combatants. If it worked in Russia, it could work here in the United States, or Britain, or Germany. 
And that leads to why total war is such a big deal. Why I believe it is so important that it requires a short answer question you must do on your next test, let alone something that really is important for the class. For the February, here's the problem with total war. What does winning look like? What does losing look like? So you can say, well, the Russian Revolution, yeah, there was a revolution to overthrew the Tsar. Now, as it turned out, they stayed in the war for a few more months. They issued that. But what does it look like if you're winning total war? Because remember, this is not a victory on the battlefield. This is trying to destroy industry, break the morale, and terrify civilians so they overthrow their government. How do you know it's working? Because one thing I've reminded you many times, we've got to come back to this. If you're going to exit full screen, you've got to hit that button. <laughs> war is a political decision. It's a political decision. These are done by politicians. And, okay, you might be, well, Kaiser Willem II is not a politician. Yeah, they're politicians. Dictators are politicians, too. They're just picked in different ways. War is a political decision to go to war, when to quit the war. It was a political decision to not go to the peace table, and therefore it's a political decision to adopt total war. It's not some military decision. These are politics. Yeah. Could a political leader just refuse to talk to Like, would they do the, whatever they're doing to decide who wins and loses? They're just like, no. It all depends, maybe. Okay, if, if enemy tanks are rolling down the streets of your capital, I guess you could still do it, but, you know, like Hitler refused to say they were losing. But he never, but that's because the Russians were 200 yards away from his bunker. But he, you know, he, the war was over. He was done. But he refused to accept it. So it all depends. So here's the deal. Think about the republic, like the United States, where you have two political parties. You elect your elected officials. Remember, it's elected officials that made the decision to go to war. Don't forget this. It's not one amorphous thing called the United States. They're representatives elected by at least some of the people, and they voted to go to war. So, can you allow dissent in a republic that's at war? AKA, a, let's say a political party that's opposed to war. Let's say a politician that's opposed to war. Can people go out and protest political decisions during a war? Like, for example, Selective service. This is a call for people to come out and oppose the draft because they're opposed to forcing young men into the army to fight a war they believe was wrong. Yes. Okay, so like in the reading, I kind of noticed this too. Isn't this a huge violation of constitutional rights? Is it? Well, if they're saying you can't talk about the war, uh, my First Amendment says I can't. Well, what's the Supreme Court going to rule? It's war. You can, but yeah. And that's the issue. You could argue that it's against constitutional right, but they said, no, we don't care. There's no constitution, we lose, so. Like with the espionage. Wouldn't that be a great assignment to look at the espionage act? I wasn't even going to do that, but yeah. That poster where it says young men, are you going to refuse to register? Yeah. Is it asking, like, it's asking a question, but it's making it little, so it just looks like the young men are refusing to register? Yeah, they're basically just trying to say, are you going to, are you going to refuse to register so you don't have rich men get rich while you go fight and die? Where they get the big war contracts. But why is the sound in, like, super little font? They want it to highlight young men yeah. refuse to register yeah. while the rich men. They went to young men refuse to register when they're they're actually not saying they're not actually telling young people to not register. They're just asking them, are you going to? They're trying to not be so confrontational. Yeah. Uh, I think we still have a republic. Um, I did. I'm really having trouble with that. You have a problem with that? No. Hey, you're either with us or against us. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't look good. Okay. So here's the thing. What they wanted was conformity. 
They don't want people dissenting. They want people to act the same. The everybody for the war effort. Unify. Because here's the deal. If people are out there protesting the war, is that a political decision? Or is the enemy winning? See the point there? By the way, what's the do they look different? That is the problem. Or if you draw a picture, this is in France, implying a French soldier brutally wounded in this war. Implying he did it just to help some get rich on wartime contracts. Is that a political statement against the reason for the war, or is the enemy winning? Or are we about to have our own revolution? Do you see the issue there? And if that is the question, then what does every country do when they go to total war? What do they ban? Yeah. They ban free speech, like the Espionage Act, which would make a wonderful assignment. The last page of that packet I gave you is a section of the Espionage Act. I, personally, with my own hands, even though I'm jealous of your typewriter now, but with my own hands, I type for you 42 questions. Most of them are hidden, but you have to answer these. And you can write on this, but it involves sentences, so it has to be written in what? Yeah. You guys are so good. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> and what day will this be due? Thursday. Thursday. And you will not believe this is the law. All 42 questions. So you have to find the hidden questions. And by oh, the way, <laughs> by the way, I gave you this back in February. Yeah, for the, I can't even say. Okay, so. <laughs> no. Uh, let me ask you one simple thing. Let's say you want to form an authoritarian dictatorship. What's the first thing you would do? First off, get a uniform. Second thing. Pick out the dictator. Declare war. Or maybe, better yet, just find an enemy. Find an enemy that says the enemy is going to take over. Once you have an enemy, what do you do? Take over. You blame everything on the enemy and say, we must all be unified to do what? And if any dissent against me, the dictator, you're doing what? And therefore, what does that allow me to do? Ban free speech. It's no coincidence that this ultimate police state would come out of total war, totalitarianism. It doesn't pass, or there's not a coincidence. And I should ask, <laughs> how do the Nazis maintain power? Who's the enemy? <laughs> Communists. By the way, in the Soviet Union, who's their enemy? The fascists. And that's how they kept power. Would that ever happen here? No. It would never happen during the Cold War. What's a red scare? Exactly. What is a red scare? <laughs> Have a good day, everybody, right when you find work, and arguably hang by your thumbs. I'm trying to decide if I should change February. There's, there's a new guy from all the covers we've got. Huh? Just scares the world. Two enemies. Yeah. Timing of hacks. Exactly. In fact, the Communist Party got one would never recover. Yeah, yeah, yeah but they're not. Oh, and remind me tomorrow I'll pass through. I was going to pass through. Now, you would wear a hat underneath. So it wouldn't like bounce like metal. How about the metal on metal? But you make it work. So this is what I want you to do. You know what I want you to do? Go head down, run into a wall, see what works. It works! Can you imagine how heavy that would be? Okay, you might not seem all that heavy, but think about that for 12 hours. That's awesome. <laughs> it might it, it also, it protects from shrapnel. Then do a thing. Then do a thing for bullets. Unless it's told you. Wednesday. Quiz. Okay. I'm sure I'm gonna take this one. I forget the context. Context.
contacts? You don't like contacts? No. I scratch my eyes really bad. When I, I understand. Them, and so, yeah. Ooh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I, I have contacts and today. it worked for me, but not everybody. Yeah. Contacts. Uh, I, can't, I wish I could wear contacts. contacts but, yeah, like a discount. And so we try to, and I. I can see my eyes. <laughs> So I just my glasses, my glasses yeah, yeah. Actually, look at this. Look at this shit. These are new glasses, and they crack in the frame. <laughs> we, what, two things about math. Number one, it's made up. Yes. Right. We all know that. Yes. Huh? And physics is equal to fashion. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I know that. Use basic math. Why are people responding? Instead of basic, yeah, use basic. Oh, another fake math contest. Well, fake and math is redundant. Me too, Mr. Parker. So let's take a quiz instead. Have you a favor, everyone? Yes! This is the reading I signed. Oh, you were. Okay, I'll give you one. Grab the phone. Here, I'll do it. Go watch. I'm not sure how we're going to what? Pretty sure we do. Hi! You know, it's better than mental. It doesn't matter. Let's go. By the way, you have a stocking cap. Yeah. Oh, that is heavy. It's really heavy. It's They, for obvious reasons, quit It was just decorative. It kind of reminded of like a medieval night. And the original one was basically just a piece of It was just a piece of tin with a spike. All right, begin. All right. What did you do with the kids? Oh, we're still filming. I'm trying to film. Like, 